Oh, I, can, I can see that in you. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, and Sam went up to the crew up north, by the way. So the callbacks went, hang on, the callbacks went like that. And, uh, and they, they encompassed our country. How about that? Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, we have to say, um, is Jim here? Jim Bradley, you in the room? <coughs> we have to say happy birthday to Jim Bradley. We have to say happy birthday to... No, no, he doesn't know what we're doing. No, Jim, hold on a minute, Jim. We have to say happy birthday to Jim. We have to say happy birthday to Glenn because it's the 4th of July. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> of course you can. Well, my birthday is in December. Yeah. Oh, it's the 4th of July. It's the 4th of July. Didn't that's you get up the... That's my birthday. Yeah. That's my independence day. Yes, thank you, Jim. <laughs> you know what he means. And that, that, you know in, what he means. People, that in a nutshell explains my relationship with Jim. <laughs> that's it. Let's open our Bibles. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, you know, I've, I've gone here this morning because... Um, Many of us are on a holiday, right? Many of us, it's, it's holiday time. And, and there's, there's a sad reality that I see often within the, within the body of Christ, and that is when holidays come, we take a holiday from the things of God for some reason. And um, I don't know if that's something you, you can have seen, but it's something that's been very evident to me. And so uh, this, is a little, this is a gentle reminder, okay? Um, let me read these verses to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 2 is all I want to look at this morning. It says this, let a man so consider us, so the Apostle Paul is talking about himself, he's talking about Apollos, he's talking about Peter, he's talking about the, the, you know, the Apostles, that this Corinthian church, they're arguing over who's more important in their lives, they're aligning themselves with these, these men. So that's what he's referring to, he says, so let us, let, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, he says, it is required in stewards that one be found, what is the word? Faithful. Let's just leave it there this morning. I want to start with a, with a confession this morning. There's a man of God whose name is not important. Well, it's important, but it's not important to this story. He's one of the nicest blokes I know. He, he really is. He loves the Lord. He has always helped me out without question or reservation whenever I've gone to him. For help, he's just he is he's just a great guy. He, he doesn't live here, in fact. In fact, he lives overseas. But for a long time, I would say to Donna, I just don't get it. And what I mean this is this: I don't get the appeal that so many people have towards this fellow's ministry. This is my confession. Remember, I just don't I just don't get it. He's everywhere all the time. He's, he's always one of these guys who gets called upon to be keynote speakers at places. He's always called upon. He's all over, in fact, he's all over the world. And I just, just didn't get it. I really just didn't get it. I mean, he, he's preaching to me, again, remember confession, nothing, nothing exceptional about it to me. He just plods along, low-key, nothing too snappy. And, and quite frankly, if I don't apply myself to this man whom I love, if I don't apply myself to his teaching, then I can drift off really, really easy. And you might be saying, well, here we are. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. But, but I, just didn't, I just didn't get the appeal. I just couldn't get it. And, and, and I couldn't honestly say to anybody, hey, go and check this guy out. Go and check this guy out, because he's going to bless your socks off. But, but the thing is, he did bless people's socks off. He, he really did. I'm the one who didn't get it, right? It got to a point with me, it got to a point where I realised this actually bothered me. And that becomes sinful, doesn't it? You know, it, it did, you know. But, but of course, the problem wasn't with my friend. Certainly it wasn't and never has been. But what I realised was, I tell you this story because what I realised was that I had fallen into the trap of measuring a man with criteria that God has no concern for whatsoever. That was the trap. Can I say that again? I fall into the trap of measuring a man by the criteria that God has no concern for whatsoever. And God has no concern for them. Why? Because they are criteria that leads us to the error of exalting a person, an individual. It's that horrible practice, and we all do it, I think, of weighing the servant of God by human standards, you know. 
We look at them and we measure them by the, the, by the letters that are after their name or before their name or however you do it, I'm not sure. Or, or by their academic standards, you know, by, by their academic abilities, by, or mistake their natural talents for spiritual giftings. You know, like they have got this incredible communication skill or they are musically talented or we simply count the number of people that are surrounding them. And what we do is we evaluate the servant of God by these, quite frankly, standards that are are very human standards. And we can find ourselves exalting the man or scratching our heads and going, I don't get it. Either way, what we are doing is, is we're focusing on the person. Well, in this passage that we've just read, Paul speaks to this error by bringing us perspective, by pointing out that we are followers of Christ and we exalt Christ and Christ only. Okay, now we know that, don't we? We know that in our heads. So let me read it again. Verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Now this perspective that I speak about is given in the words that he uses. You can use different words. He calls himself or them servants. And there are different words that are used in the Bible to describe the servants of God in that language. Here, Paul uses a word, whether or not I say it right or not is not important, but it's hyperatus is the word, the Greek word that he uses. And what it does, it describes a subordinate, someone that is under, of course, a person of lower rankings that's ranking than somebody else. In fact, he uses a word that is, that is, is referred to or translated as an under rower. And so... Now, people argue over the use of that term, under rower, in, 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 um, in expounding this word, but the original readers, those Corinthian believers, it would have meant something to them. Because do you know who the under rower was? The under rower was the man or the people that were down below decks in those ancient galleys, those ancient warships. They were under the deck, down there, with those big oars. You've seen it in the movies, haven't you? Those big oars in their hands, sticking out the side of the hull, and they see no daylight. All they can see, actually, is one person that is standing on the top deck, or they can hear this one person that is on the standing on the top deck, and he is giving the instruction, he is giving the orders, but they are all there chained together, these slaves, pulling on these oars. You've seen it, haven't you? You've seen the image. And to the, again, to the original readers, this word he had used, let a man so consider us as servants, would have meant something to them. And so when he says again, let us, let us, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, he's giving them this powerful perspective, speaking again of himself and Apollos and Peter and others, that the Corinth, these are the men that the Corinthian believers were dividing themselves over, and he says, none of us. He says, not me, not Peter, not Apollos, none of us are the captain of this ship. None of us are in charge. He says, we are all, every one of us, no more than galley slaves who take orders from above. You Corinthians, Paul is saying, are running around behind men. You are dividing yourselves amongst men. You are causing strife. You are causing division amongst yourself because you are putting yourself under human beings. But he says, we are all just under rowers, every one of us. We are all servants of Christ. We are all under the direction of Christ. He is our captain. We obey him without hesitation. He is the one who gives the commands. We follow them with our questions. Ours, he says, is not a prestigious position to exalt us by. It is not. You've got to get the picture, right, of what's been drawn in this opening verse. We are all, all of us, pulling on the same oars. We are all, all of us, going in the same direction, towards the same end. We don't set the course. We don't determine the direction. None of us is any more important than anybody else. None of us. One slave of Christ, Paul is driving home the point here, one slave of Christ is no different from another. And if I was up to ask you in this room, would any slaves in Christ please put their hands up, would you do it? Put your hands up, slaves in Christ. All of us. Every single one of us. Again, with the oars in our hands, going in the same direction, 
that are set not by us, but by the captain who is above, giving the commands. That's the image here. So he says, consider us this way. In other words, keep this perspective in your mind about all of the body of Christ. But also, he wants us to know at the same time, yes, we are under rollers, but at the same time, he wants us to know that we are servants, as servants of Christ, we are also stewards, he says, of the mysteries of God. So can you hold that first perspective in your mind as we now move to another one, and that is that we are all stewards of the mysteries of God. What's a steward? A steward is a person who manages his master's household. It's, it's in the simplest of terms, he owns nothing. Nothing belongs to him, but everything is placed at his disposal and control for the purpose of taking care of the master's family. So he has all the cash at his control. And he, and he brings in or buys everything that is needed for the family and he keeps exact accounts of how he uses that provision because the day will come when his master is going to hold him accountable for how he has handled his master's goods, being the servant, or the steward, I should say. Paul says, hey, we're all servants, we're all under rowers. He says, we're all stewards. So we've got a balance here. We recognise, we respect the gifting of God in a person who serves Christ but we don't exalt them. That's so human, isn't it? And, and, and it, is such, it is such a play within the Western church when we have all these celebrities lifted up. Right? Paul is saying, no, none of us are celebrities. We're all under rowers. We're all servants. We recognise and we respect them because they are entrusted with God's wealth to share with the family of God. And, and that's all of us, right? The family of God. We're all the household of faith, the book of Galatians tells us. So, so what is this wealth, I guess, is the next question, that a servant steward shares with the family of God? Paul here in this verse calls it, calls it the mysteries of God. Um, he spoke about this earlier in this book, in fact, in the, in the second chapter in verse 7, when he said, we speak the wisdom of God. It is a mystery he says it's the hidden wisdom God ordained before the ages for our glory. He's talking about the wisdom of how the lost might be saved. He's talking about the wisdom that is fulfilled in the church of Jesus Christ. He's talking about God's salvation through Christ for all mankind, for Jew and Gentile alike. The incredible forgiveness that sets us free from all condemnation. He's talking about this great wealth that has been given to all of us as stewards of the manifold wisdom of God. You know, the, the wisdom that brought freedom from slavery. I mean, that's what Ben and the guys took to that man on the park bench. As stewards of God, they took this wisdom to the, to the man and the man, of course, cries out for what his soul is longing for. We're stewards of it. Freedom, stewards of what it is to know the freedom from the consequences of our sin. The wisdom of holiness and sanctification, knowing that God is calling every single one of us, setting us apart for something far greater than we could ever imagine in our own humanness. Sanctified, being glorified, being changed from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ. It's wisdom from God that was revealed to all of us, knowing that our life has purpose in the hands of a loving creator. The wisdom of God's gifting and the wisdom of God's empowering to life, a life that is fruitful and a blessing. No, as it says, blessed to be a blessing. It's God's wisdom revealed. You're stewards of this, every one of you. Jesus, in fact, in the the kingdom parables refers to them as the treasures of God to our hearts. Paul would speak again of these mysteries of God as being revealed. In fact, let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 3. With the Apostle Paul speaking, he says this in Ephesians 3, 2. Of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how by... Revelation, God made known to me the mystery. And I just want to pick out of this. He says in verse 4, by which we may understand his knowledge of the mysteries of Christ. He said in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. It was hidden. 
as it has now been revealed by the spirit of his holy apostles and prophets, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. He went on to speak about the preaching, the unsearchable riches in, in verse 8, make known, he says in verse 9, what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. In verse 10 he says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in heavenly places. Did you get what he said there? He said that, that this wisdom is that even the angels of heaven didn't understand. Now being revealed through the church of Jesus Christ. That's incredible, don't you think? It says in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him, in verse 16, he spoke of being strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. He spoke about verse 18, comprehending with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height of, of Christ's love. And being filled with the fullness of God in verse 19. I, I know there was a lot there. And we need to meditate upon those verses. But these are the mysteries that have been entrusted to us as faithful servant stewards of God. And I want you to notice something there, back in Corinthians, that this person, the faithful servant steward, he's not a man pleaser. He's not a man pleaser at all. In fact, it says in verse 2 that we read, moreover, it is required in stewards to be one, to be found faithful. And when I say not a man pleaser, that is that he is faithful to Christ, his master, the captain of the ship, the one who gives the orders, the one who sets the direction. A faithful steward is not always going to please every member of the household. That, that's the point here. You know, The minister of Christ is called by God to preserve and to protect and to disperse God's truth. Not about being popular. Not about having celebrity leaders lifted up. Remember again, what was the problem with the Corinthian church? They were dividing themselves over loyalties to mere men. Me a man. And so the issue could never be this. Is Paul relevant anymore? Because that was the argument. He's not relevant anymore. You know, it could never be is Paul relevant. It could never be, hey, Apollos is such a, a far more eloquent speaker. None of that. None of that. No, there will always be the critical. I mean, you just ask Moses about that. You go and look at Moses' story. The only thing that really matters is did Paul, did Apollos, you could even say, the only thing that really matters, does Chris treat, teach truth as a faithful steward, or can I address you here? Because I think I can in this matter. Are you being faithful to the things that God has assigned to you as a steward? Now, we are either faithful stewards or we are unfaithful stewards. There's no middle ground here, none at all. This is what I love about what Ben's been doing. As I said to you, it's a reminder that every day, that every moment of our life is an opportunity to be exercising, yes, the graces of God in our lives, to be a faithful minister of, those stu those, of that stewardship that he's put upon our lives. No, every, every, single, every single one of us is a steward. You're a faithful steward or you're an unfaithful steward. Sometimes we don't like to hear that. If you want to go to Luke's Gospel, if you don't like to hear that, don't do it now, but go to Luke's Gospel and read chapter 12, where Jesus is talking about the wise steward. And, what he's, and he's talking about his coming. He's coming again. And he's talking about faithfulness until he comes. The interesting thing about that whole passage, I encourage you, go back and read Luke chapter 12. But the interesting thing, stuck right in the middle of two sayings of Jesus about his return and faithfulness, he simply, we have Peter jumping in there. And you can slap Peter for this when you see him. But you can see Peter jumping in there and asking Jesus the question, Lord, do you speak these parables only to us, the 12, or do you speak to all people? And then Jesus begins to unfold teaching again. And clearly it's to all people. So maybe you can blame Peter for this, for bringing it up. But the plain, obvious truth is that God created us and shaped us for his purposes. For his purposes. Ephesians, again, chapter 1, verse 5 says, Having predestined us 
unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of, of his will, the captain's will. And we, again, we read in Ephesians, well known, chapter 2, in verse 10, where it says, For we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So God has given, God has gifted, God has equipped, and he's brought us, all of us, every single one of us in this room, he's brought us all through sad circumstances in life that ensure we all have things of him that he has placed in us to hand out as stewards of the manifold graces to everyone around us. What does Peter say? He says in 1 Peter chapter 4, he says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And what are these gifts? Well, look at this church. Look around us. What have we got? We've got teachers on holidays. <coughs> sorry, too many teachers in this church. That's my problem. <laughs> you guys are always sorry. We've got teachers. We've got builders. We've got chefs. We've got healthcare professionals, both physical and psychological. We've got farmers. We've got childcare professionals. We've got all sorts of trades in this church. We've got musicians. We've got mothers. We've got fathers. We've got husbands. We've got wives. We've got young. We've got old. We've got people that have been delivered from all sorts of addictions. We've got people that have been healed from so many different sicknesses. We have people with money. We have people without money. People that know what it is to struggle in marriage. People that know the glorious victories of marriage. People that have, have even failed in marriage. We've got it all. We have people that have known great grief within their lives. And some of us continue in ongoing struggles. We know great blessing. We know great prosperity. I'm sorry, have I missed anybody? Did I hit you all just then? Got us? That's great. But here's the thing. I say that because every one of us exists in a reality that has potential to bless others. Every single one of us. And what we need to know, as one preacher says, we don't need to be in the ministry to serve God because the ministry is in us. Did you hear that? We don't need to be in the ministry to serve God because the ministry is in us. And that's all I want to say to you today. And I'm so grateful for what, for what Ben shared because it expresses exactly what I'm trying to say here. Both high and low, it doesn't matter. Heavy or light, grief or joy, again, it doesn't matter. Gain or loss, you are equipped to do, to be something to someone else that no one else can be. Did that make any sense to you? That no one else can be because God has placed within you the resource for that circumstance that God has brought you across this day, whether you're on holidays or not, it doesn't matter. You are an under rower. You are a steward of the manifold grace of God. And what we are called to do is not to determine where to go or when to go or even how to go. We just go and we distribute it. We just have to recognise those opportunities that come our way. And I'll say it again, every single day. Every single day, we are under rowers for Christ. Can you hold that picture in your head? I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. We are his under rowers. He is our captain. We are rowing to his beat. We are pulling together as his fellow servants. And where he directs is not our concern. Hard to let that go, isn't it? Where he directs is not our concern. We go wherever he leads. Mine is just to be faithful. Yours is just to be faithful. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, God bless you on your holidays. And, and just be, be prepared and be ready and be amazed at what God can do with every moment. You know, I've said it so many times. You're sick of me saying it. But God saved us. He filled us with his spirit. He put his word within our hearts. He's given us the mind of Christ. He's established us in a family somewhere. He's given us a spiritual home somewhere. 
He's given us all of these things and every aspect of that which God has put into you is for His glory, it's for His purpose, it's for the extension of His kingdom. That's what we've got to realize. That's living, isn't it? That's life. We're not just plotters. We're striving forward in the things of the kingdom. We're seeing the kingdom grow. And as we see the kingdom grow, that is overshadowed by the reality that the king is coming so very soon. Amen? All right. Let's, um, let's, let's, let's steal our hearts. You know what I always say, and I failed to say it today, that um, we like to gather around the word, and we like to allow God to minister to our hearts so that we can then gather around the table, the communion table, together as a family. Because that's, that's what this is all about. That's what God has always, always been about. You know, you go back to the very beginning, to the garden. What was God doing? What was the creator of heaven and earth doing in the garden? He was creating family, wasn't he? He was bringing together family. You know? That's the thing that amazes me about God. He longs to be with us. He longs to experience us. You know, and of course, the great tragedy is that we, as, a, as, as his creation, pulled ourselves away and said no to that family. Isn't that a horrible thought? You know, we just think about that in today's terms. It's a tragic thing when we see a family disintegrate and we see family members that don't want to have part of their families. And it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts when you see it. It hurts when you experience it. And that's what happened to God's family. It was broken. Family members rejecting the great love and the great purpose of that family to grow and to fill the earth and to share the glory and the joy of the, of the Father. But how wonderful it is that every one of us can now look and see just how great and just how committed that our God is to his family. And it's reflected nowhere greater than, than at the communion table, isn't that right? Where, as Jim says to us all the time, heaven gave everything that it had to give that we might experience everything that we need to have, and that is fellowship with our God, to be brought back into fellowship with our God. So Jesus says, every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Yes, we remember the great sacrifice. We, we remember the incredible price that God was willing to pay, the depth of his love, that we might once again be in fellowship with him, now and for all eternity. We remember the enormity of the price but, but let us never forget why the price was paid and, and the heart that it's coming from. It's coming from a God that just says, I love my children so much. I don't want anything to come between us. Nothing. And so we gather in this place today. We take this emblem, this piece of bread, and we remember that that love was expressed that was expressed upon a cross 2,000 years ago and it was to cover everything that was in and of us that separates us from him, to cover it all, to take it all, that we might experience everything that is in and of him. It's, it's, it's a divine, it's the divine mystery that Paul was talking about. It's a divine exchange when God took it all that he might give all. So Father, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, and I just pray in this room today that each and every one of us would be reminded of this great love that is, that is born in your heart and birthed in ours. And the great purpose you have, Father, in our life today. Let us follow in the steps of the one who declared it. Let us follow in the steps of the one who was lifted up, that all men might be drawn unto him. And I pray, Father God, that each and every one of us would recognize each and every day we have an opportunity to walk in those steps and to share that love. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus crucified in our place. Let's take the bread together that reminds us of his body. Thank you, Father.
and this precious, precious cup. Thank you, Father, for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Father, for doing it all for us. Thank you for washing me, for washing us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Just take the cup. Please.